if people sign in after um, they can't see the previous chat messages. Okay. I'll I'll send it again after we start. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, I will take notes in our kind of general notes document, just so you know. But obviously, you're welcome to take notes too. <laughs> Good to see you, Lucas. This time in two dimensions. <laughs> Good to see you, Bill. Glad we made it. Take my jacket off for this one. We were just, I was just in a meeting with Lucas up at the Environment Committee <clears throat> earlier today. Lucas, do you um do you have access to who we are expecting? Um, yes. Since I resent the invite this morning, I kind of got rid of them, but I know that in addition to who's here, we're also expecting um Director Carey to come by. He had indicated he was coming. Other than that, let me take a look and see if I have any. Like Heather's out driving in the snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm chasing down those feral pigs. <laughs> Are you? God, this that <laughs> is taking just an inordinate amount of my time. No, it's like DOAG says it's all set and USDA says it doesn't. I have dozens of feral pigs running around in a town that now we can't catch them because they're smart. Wow. Oh. <laughs> God, you know? <laughs> God, <laughs> I uh, wish it was. I have to laugh because they 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 actually have their own Facebook page now. It's called <laughs> the Sterling Pig Patrol. If you're ever really bored, it's just the things, the pictures of these pigs doing things that are actually obscene are just unbelievable. <laughs> it's just, oh my God. So I'm gonna go off video while I'm driving, but I wanted to, you know, just check in and say hi. <laughs> I'm going to be here. I just won't be on video. All right. <laughs> okay. Thanks for checking in. <laughs> and I'm going to go check out the Sterling Pig Patrol now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's get started. Um, our agenda today uh, is very similar <laughs> to our That's past agenda. Right, exactly. So, um, I will put in the link to kind of our overview notes document. Tessa also added a link to the engagement document, which is going to be covered today. So there are two different links in that file in our chat box right now. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for Jan Wednesday, January 24th. Um, I do apologize. I had said that I would have our kind of recommendations report um, much more populated. I did get COVID and, um, and just back to work a few days ago and finding I'm exhausted. So it, it slowed it down, but I'm hoping to get that out um, early next week to everyone uh, so that you can start to review that, um, you know, that pulling together of all of the ideas that we've been discussing thus far. 
I believe that that's all of my intro stuff. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Tessa and Zach. The goal today is to talk about that engaging community piece um, of our recommendations. And just as a reminder, this was something that came up early in our meetings in the fall. Um, it was one of the topics that we identified as important um, uh, to include and to think about and to discuss. So my hope is that um, we can make some recommendations around engaging the community. Um, and then towards the end of this uh, meeting, just touch base on any outstanding issues or thoughts that people have had um, regarding recommendations and what we might wanna capture um, in, in those recommendations. Uh, my last comment is that our next meeting, we have no you know, no lead speaker scheduled. It's basically our next meeting is just reviewing what we've come up with as a group for those recommendations, making sure we all agree and that we haven't left something out. So that uh, we do have all of our next session to um, to kind of more critically evaluate everything as a whole. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tessa and Zach. Thanks, Jamie. Um, first, we want to make sure that everyone has access to that document. So if you don't, raise your hand. Okay. I don't see a lot of people in there, but. Okay. So Zach and I met and actually we wanted to give, you don't have it, Jamie? I, I actually need to request edit access. Oh, you know what? Sorry. I will switch to my other account. Okay. <laughs> so we just wanted to give kudos to Bill because you did a great job engaging us last week. And so we wanted to just follow suit. So just a quick background, because as I was reading through the report and talking um, with Zach, there was a lot about educating communities. And we tend to think more of engaging the communities. There's definitely education. That's our, you know, the goal we're working towards is, is all of us learning. But um, you know, three types of engagement that we typically use in extension are informative, which is just trying to increase awareness of a particular subject. So in this case, eelgrass and eelgrass management. And that's where we gain credibility with our audience and, and get buy-in, which we don't necessarily have because we have such a small group right now and we really haven't been able to get out to communities about this. Um, and then the second stage is then to solicit their ideas and input, which again, with just a small group, we haven't reached some key stakeholders and we'll get to that. Um, but that's, you know, more collaboration that will be beyond the scope of this initial phase. And then it's decision-making, right? That's really what we're working towards is to make sure that everyone comes to the table and they can inform the, pro the process, whether they're the ones making the decision or they're just uh, contributing to a discussion where ultimately someone in authority will make a decision. So um, what we, we have two exercises that we wanted to go through. I'll walk us through the first and then Zach will walk us through the second. And so we have a table of that and the first column has a number of different stakeholder types. And we're going to walk through that table, but first some considerations about engagement. So we want you to think about as we walk through this, what stakeholder groups are missing, if any, um, are this column on the left, um, are they unique stakeholder groups or can any of them can be, be combined or do we need to separate them into distinct groups? Um, if we're aware of the motivations um, with respect to eelgrass and eelgrass management of these groups and protecting eelgrass, um, if we could identify those, uh, what are key messages that we want them to hear? So that's sort of the education piece, right? Um, and then if we know, how do we describe our relationships either as individuals or organizations or this work group ourselves with these different stakeholder groups? So are there existing relationships that we can capitalize on and then work towards engaging them and helping them with the decision-making process and them helping us with decision-making processes in, in the near um, and maybe further afield future of eelgrass management. Um, and then what are challenges or opportunities to working with these groups? And I think in our first meeting back in the fall, we were talking about 
wanting to talk to fishermen and aquaculturists and maybe marina owners and the fact that it's really hard to get them into the room. And so what are some creative ways to, to solicit their input, to gain their buy-in on this process? Again, not just our process, because we're on a very short timeline, but the greater process that's happening across Long Island Sound and in, in eelgrass management. So in this table, what we've done is again, try to break this down into the stakeholder type, uh, their concerns or motivations, our key messages. Uh, we may not know these yet. Um, and then relationships, whether they're weak, strong, or otherwise, and then identifying some challenges or opportunities to being able to engage them. So um, we wanted to have you help us fill this out. So let's see, we have one, two three, four, five, six, seven, eight of us that are able to type, right? So why don't we assign you that way? And I just, to, sorry, Tessa, I can't, mine's not letting me edit. I switched okay. to my, my, my save the sound account. And it still wouldn't do it. Okay. So. Yeah. I, same thing. I, I requested ac edit access and, uh, haven't haven't seen that yet. So and I have seen because I can't see the uh, the document in the car. It's just too much. But um, okay, I am happy to facilitate meeting with fishermen. I'm a honorary member of SNEFLA. I could make that happen if you know we want to move forward. With that um, I can't see the document right now, but I think engaging in local yacht clubs would be a really good idea, and I can help with that too because many of those folks. You know, they all have boats, they're all in the water, but they also, at least in the shoreline where I am, um, they are very conscious of the environment. So I think that's a really good way to spread the word. Yacht clubs do, you know, talks and presentations. So I, I, I wanted to make sure I added that to the list rather than just marina owners. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay so I just changed access. So if you're still having a problem, let me know. You may need to refresh your screen. Everyone good now? Awesome. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to go around the screen and okay. Larry, could you uh, tackle researchers? And Jamie, state and federal regulators. And let's see, Zach, ENGOs. Kelly, could you do water quality monitoring groups? David, would you do fishermen? And let's see, Brad, could you do aquaculturists? And let's see, Lucas, recreational boaters, and who I'm at, Bill, did I give you something? Okay, Bill, recreational angler, anglers. And could you also do commercial anglers? Just anglers. Sorry, I'm sorry. I think you're assigning staff people some responsibilities that they're not able to do. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Who did I put on here? For Lucas and Brad. Oh, sorry. Okay, so did I get everyone? Let's see. Okay. Larry, I'm also going to give you aquaculturists. Jamie, I'm going to give you boaters. Um, I'll take these two. Zach, I'll give you restoration. All right, so if you would just do your best to complete these and then we'll go through them. Let's take about five-ish minutes.
Let's give it until 325 because it looks like you're still busy at work. Okay, it looks like the typing is has slowed down. So why don't we get started and we can walk through these one by one. So Larry, do you want to just give us a quick overview of yours? Yeah, well, 
I mean, th from the reacher's point of view, it's it's more like this is in their bailiwick and their and their job in, in essence. So from a concern and motivations, it's doing what comes naturally. I mean, what what are the factors uh, influencing the decline and what to do about it? So uh, I interpreted our key messages as what our message was to them. And it was using their expertise to, you know, to develop the, the best monitoring programs and what are the best restoration techniques because that's what they do. They're researchers. So I thought being first, I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess I'll look. Yeah. Is that about what you're looking for? Or, or exactly. Yeah? That's great. Okay. okay. And anyone can type in these as we go along. Um, Jamie, do you want to step in with regulators? All right. So I um, I said that, you know, similar to researchers, this is, of, of you know, their work area. So protect, protection of existing eelgrass and encouraging expansion of eelgrass um, is one of their concerns, all within the context of existing regulations around shoreline development, navigation, shellfish, et cetera. So um, they are, you know, they want to encourage eelgrass, but um, but are doing it in this, you know, landscape of competing needs. Uh, their motivation is uh, they they have, I don't know if mandate is the right word, but they have a mandate to protect the environment while allowing sustainable development and industry to occur. So stri striking that balance between protecting the environment while not shutting everybody out of it. Um, I think our key message to this group is just to keep them updated on the current knowledge of restoration science so that they're able to make those decisions um, with the most up-to-date information. Um, and then also sharing, um, you know, sharing what's going on in the restoration community. I think a lot of our state and federal regulators are tied into that community, but making sure that that link remains strong so that we're, we have our regulators interacting with our researchers and um and NGOs and practitioners and you know making sure that they're at the table for those discussions. Um, the other thing I thought was a good message is sharing the concerns of various communities and stakeholders that are represented in this table. I think that um, regulators often have pretty easy access to researchers and NGOs, um, but that facilitation with the stakeholders like the recreational boaters or, or um, commercial fishermen, aquaculturists, I think that gets a little um, harder for all of us to maintain those connections. All of us who are doing this as work to maintain connections with people who this is you know, tangential to their work, related, but not their primary focus of their job day to day. Thanks, Jamie. That was great. Right, Zach? Zach, you're on Zach, mute. Zach, you're, you're muted. Classic. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yeah. So I just want to, I made this note at the end that it really can depend on what the focus of an NGO is on when, when talking about what their concerns and motivations are. But if we're talking generally, um, these groups are usually concerned with environmental sustainability, education and outreach of uh, getting outside and, and our coastal environment and restoring ecosystems. And uh, I think what our, messages to these groups can be is, you know, what are the best uh, practices and techniques when trying to restore eelgrass? Uh, how can you get involved? And just to make sure that they're aware of each other and aware of all the efforts going on in the state so that groups can work together and not work in their own silos. And as well as um, making sure that we know that they all exist and we're aware of what they're trying to do and we want to help them in the best way that we can. Thanks, Zach. Yeah. 
Okay, Kelly. All right, so for um, community water quality monitoring groups, um, my experience is mostly their concerns are with clean water for public recreational use um, and use of the upland areas that contribute pollutants and impact clean water. And so I thought a good message is um, yellow grass has an indicator of good water quality and potential engagement. You know, if there's yellow grass in their area of interest, can they observe it? Um, and then understanding best land use practices that promote clean water and eelgrass health. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. David? I just put in the regulatory policy so that it's um, focus activity and whatever you want to call it, it's almost a bunch of. David, we can't hear you well. Do you, can you turn up your mic? Please? Maybe. Um, oh, that's better. So the regulatory policy just prohibits shellfish activity when within 50 feet of field grass, clumps, bunches, or patches rather than dense forests. Um, that's obviously a concern. Um, but from the other side of it is, you know, what is, you know, what is what, what is the impact of these stands and do they enhance um, recruitment in areas? Um, obviously, we don't have many um, strong eelgrass stands where we get oyster recruitment, but the fact is, is 100 years ago, that probably was the opposite. So it will be very interesting um, if there isn't a positive impact. Um, in, in some regards, especially if you can um, put some flexibility in the regulatory policy. Okay, great, thank you. Larry? Yeah, on this one is, I, I kind of felt that this group would probably be the most knowledgeable uh, on the areas we're talking about. So trying to think of what's to focus in on what they would be most, most helpful to us would be, uh, and I thought identifying sustainable practices to minimize those negative impacts on eelgrass, but, would really be a good source to provide the educational material on the significance of eelgrass and restoration efforts since they're, this is kind of their bag. Um, so I try to keep it simple. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so Larry, in, in that case, were you thinking about people that are growing eelgrass or growing, because I, I actually didn't clarify that, or people that are growing other things like shellfish. Yeah, I thought it was the more, you know, the generic area. Okay. Not, not just people that grew eelgrass per se. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Jamie? Um, so this is the recreational boaters. I think that the concern is just limitations or restrictions on their ability to access areas, like that we not, you know, fence off theoretically areas where they can't go, um, and limitations on their ability to anchor, um, I think would probably be a concern. In terms of motivation, I think most recreational boaters recognize that they want a, you know, good water quality a vibrant Long Island Sound because that's they want to enjoy it recreationally. Um, in terms of the education efforts, of uh, Fishers Island uh, Seagrass Management Coalition has a "Look Before You Drop" campaign, which I think has been um, pretty effective, and they have stickers and outreach material, and that seems like a good thing to encourage throughout Long Island Sound. The idea being that you don't anchor in eelgrass, you kind of look before you drop your anchor. Um, and then also uh, potentially informing people to the benefits of eelgrass, why it's a good thing to have, you know, versus people saying, oh, I don't like swimming through it. I don't want, you know, it's clogging up my engine. I don't want to deal with that. So, um, you know, finding ways to uh, perhaps encourage people to snorkel in eelgrass beds or fish in eelgrass beds 
um, as they provide benefits um, as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I good, added a question in how, a how is, question. um, <laughs> okay. So we, we don't have to talk about that now, but we should, you know, definitely answer that question of how do they measure the effectiveness of these outreach messages? I think that's one of the most challenging jobs that we have in extension too, is, you know, we do a lot of outreach and education and, you know, assume that there's action taken. Um, and it's really hard to measure that. So but it's important to do that and make sure that the, the action taken is a, actually as a result of the work that we do. Okay, Bill, you've got recreational and commercial anglers. Yeah, and I'm not sure if there is a, a direct motivation um, for eelgrass, but maybe with, with recreational, um, just the individual fishermen, not the, char not the party boats, um, you know, from my experience as a recreational angler, the the experience out in the eastern sound where it's clear and there's a nice eelgrass meadow and there's silver sides all clumped up, clumped up on it and a school of bluefish or stripers come in and people can catch those fish on a topwater plug in shallow water is really kind of one of the quintessential experiences, sport fishing experiences on the sound. And so I think the message is the more the more of that type of habitat and water quality that we create, the greater the opportunity to have that experience. Um, and then with the, the party boats, they have, I mean, the motivation for them obviously is having a healthy environment. So there's a lot of fish around. Uh, so there's not a lot of restrictions on bag limits and not restrictions on size limits. Um, so they can attract a lot of customers. And um, I don't know the party boats, how much they actually interact with eelgrass on the sound, but I know some of the species that they really like to go for and are right now are in decline, such as fluke, and they're going to be very restricted. Um, I was just actually at a charter boat meeting uh, two nights ago that was put on by deep. And there was a, a bunch of operators there voicing several concerns so I think the message is if we if we can clean up the the sound to the point where it has a lot of eelgrass meadows, you're probably going to see a lot of fish around. Um, so um, that's the main message. A healthy habitat uh, means you're going to have healthy fish stocks. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Zach? I just wanted to note that Kelly has her hand up. So if you want to make a comment, go ahead. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, sorry. Just takes me a minute to get to the screen, which is behind everything. Um, I just wanted to see when we were talking about recreational boaters, you know, motor boaters, definitely kayakers. Are the, Is that the same in the same category? We or can not? put them in their own category. Yeah I, was just, yeah, I was just wondering, or like, you know, I mean, I guess it depends. They're really not... <sighs> probably not as damaging to the environment, depending on, you know, the person, but also swimmers. I don't know if they would be a separate category too. Swimmers typically don't like feeling the eelgrass below them, especially swimming at low tide um, and think it's like seaweed, you know? So um, it gets bad. It gets a bad rap in swimming areas. Thanks, Kelly. I'll work that in. Okay. Got yeah, I mean, we can also get back to it later and talk about it. If you want to fill that in um, as we're going along. Okay. Be great. So the next group that I have is, uh, is shoreline restoration practitioners. I kind of see these similarly to environmental NGOs. I mean, I, I don't interact with these people a lot, so I could be wrong, but their goal is usually to restore a specific area in their community, and um, they kind of want the best practices and current knowledge of how to do that restoration, and that's kind of 
what we could provide to them in my mind, but I think it might be able to be combined with the other group. Um, but I'd be happy to hear other people's opinions on that. I'd like to throw out an opinion on that um, just yeah. briefly. I think right now that that those two groups overlap a lot, but my personal hope is that we get a group of restoration practitioners that might be doing this as their job. And so at that point, you know, they become a separate group. Uh, you know, it, it could be our NGOs taking on the restoration work, but I could also, I mean, in, in an ideal world, you know, we have people where that's their job, they go restore eelgrass and they're the, you know, so I, I would like to keep them separate. Although I agree right now, they're one and the same, I think. I'd be curious to hear, like, in your vision of that, like, like, are they their own independent companies or who who's employing them or how are they operating? Yeah, I think, I think their own independent companies. I think if we can, um, monetize the that type of work if we can make it sustainable um that we might get different groups coming in to do that and it could be that it's a subset of ngos or consultants or um you know even aquaculturists who are looking for additional work you know i think that there's um a lot of people where if we had the funds available to support that restoration that we could probably find people with boats and skilled divers that want to come and do this. Um, I, I think that there are precedents for this in other places, um, Massachusetts and, and uh, down in the Chesapeake region. Um, our, closest, uh, our closest to it is um, Cornell Cooperative Extension, where for a while they really focused on seagrass restoration and they've expanded their seagrass program now but the people who work in that unit, you know, you go back 10 years, that's all they did was seagrass restoration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That definitely makes sense. Yeah. And then the monet monetization is like mitigation fund, in loop fee funds and yeah. our carbon credits or something along those lines, not just grant money. So maybe they would need education on that. Yeah, it's a good point. Like if if we were to do that, you know, you probably want some kind of training program that DEEP and DEC have signed off on and, you know, that to kind of bring in someone who's looking to start a business but needs to get educated on the right things to do it and develop their network. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Jamie and, and the rest of the group, do you think we should also include coastal engineers in this as well, in this group? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right, Kelly, um, tell us about municipal commissions, please. Yes. Uh, so, um, you know, concerns, clean water, fish, shell fish harvesting, um, Recreational, definitely some also, I think, oversee some commercial activities as well. Um, uh, they need an abundant harvest or they like to have an abundant harvest. They may be concerned with uptake of nutrients competing between eelgrass. I'm not sure if they think about it that technically, but definitely competition for space. And um, this also might be even reflective with the shell fishermen. I felt like after reading or hearing what Dave wrote, it's similar thought process, but um, so, and I'm not sure about like messaging, you know, once eelgrass are established, it can absorb nutrients, you know, keeps the water clean and then, you know, beneficial relationship between scallops and eelgrass. And, you know, Dave had mentioned possibly retention of um, um, the spat also with eelgrass present, so. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Uh, so I had coastal property owners, and I was thinking that they would be wondering how it would affect their ability to construct a dock or a seawall in front of their home, and then how would that affect access if there was some sort of restoration project in front of their home? How might it affect their property values? 
positively or negatively in the case that they can't build the dock if there's some sort of uh, restoration project there and just had a feeling that they'd probably want to be involved in any decisions that ultimately could affect their project. So they're probably the ones that may be really difficult to reach because there are so many of them and we don't have good points of contact, but they would probably be the ones that ultimately would be loud voices in the decision-making process, whether, whether it was for their individual property or, you know, if this was a homeowner's association and something was happening within the, the area of their homeowner association. So this is an important group. And I think just the, all the key messages that we think of that eelgrass is an important habitat, it's protected, but also communicating the fact that their riparian rights are protected is important. Um, and uh, water quality improvements may be a benefit there to them and all of the other, you know, recreational shell fishing, depending on if they're engaged in that. Um, for marina owners and operators and yacht club, I was thinking along a similar line of thinking. Um, so again, there it may be their ability to lengthen their dock or change their dock configuration or install moorings. Um, you know, and that's going to affect their property values, um, whether they can do those activities or not. And they probably also want to be involved in the decision-making processes, especially since it's going to affect their business. And the same sort of messages, um, but I think, um, I'm not sure, um, I have to think more about the, the benefits to them. Um, I really wasn't able to crack that nut. But I think these are important places where we could potentially get messages to broader groups. So there are a lot of people that are wealthy, not wealthy, um, di diverse demographics that are um, either members of yacht clubs or have their boat there or visitors that um, come to these places. And we could be talking to them about a variety of topics, including eelgrass habitat and management. Um, there are also lots of pump out boats, you know, that um, transit these facilities. Um, so I think, you know, there could be standalone uh, messaging um, signage at these sites, the potential for outreach presentations to big groups. Um, a lot of the marinas have new newsletters or email groups too. So I feel like this is one group where we don't have a lot of strong connections, but there's huge potential in terms of, of reaching big audiences. Yeah, um, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, you know, on, on land, we got to like the 490 program to provide tax advantages. And I was thinking, is there something, you know, for coastal owners, even though they don't necessarily, they don't own the land on which the eelgrass grows, but they control access to it and you know docking and you know boating and that kind of stuff you know is there some construct that would aid in the restoration progress uh, process that could warrant some tax abatement for coastal owners just asking don't know the answer but i'll put it in there <laughs> do you want me to do you want me to call the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities now or later? <laughs> Immediate <laughs> action item. Well, that's a state that the 490 is a state program. It's not a local program. So right. No. And they did do that for the shell fishermen. So now yeah. shellfish leases that are, are taxable are taxed um at a, a farmer rate. Right, right. Yeah. And but I coastal see, property owners don't own land in the water, so I don't know how you could how you could abate their taxes. No, that that's what I started with. They don't own the land, but they got access to it. So I just I, I hadn't thought. Right, of it. But it's they have access to land that's held in trust by the state of Connecticut. I, yeah, you're, <laughs> yeah. You're you're creating you're creating a big mess there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> All right. Um, I saw someone adding in some good thoughts here on marina uh, operators. So storm surge absorption and property protection. So those are those are great ideas. And actually for coastal property owners too, that may be 
interested in seawalls and told they can't build them, you know, seagrass habitat can potentially attenuate that wave action to some degree. So that's great. Tessa, okay, I wanted to just add something really quick too. Please do. Um, would we consider like public boat ramps in the same category as marina operators and yacht clubs? That could be another place you could have information on eelgrass if it's a public boat ramp that's near where eelgrass and beds might be. It might be a good opportunity as well. Okay, I'll add that in there. Oh, I'd have to look into this too, because I know we've done like outreach at the public boat launches for invasives, um, not tracking the weeds to another pond and such. And there's also maybe an opportunity in the um, the fishing guide that's published every year or made available every year. I don't know how many people read it except for me, but um, there is a lot of information in it. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and I apologize, David, I sort of added your name in the end, but I didn't tell you about this general public. So I guess I'll just throw it out there. I mean, are there any messages that, you know, we want to throw out there to the broader audience, you know, not being able to, that's, that's the most difficult when you just say, you know, throw some information at people. What are they going to do with that information? We have a billboard that says, Eel grass is important. I mean, are there other groups that <laughs> so, want to reach? Yeah, well, you know, like a lot of the state parks, well, not all of them, but Ham and Asset, for instance, has the nature center, which can be a messaging center. Um, it could, you know, maybe even support a little meadow. I'm not sure what they have there, but, you know, if they had some grasses and a little demonstration tank, um, that would be a great way to reach people. Um, you know, and I know at least at Rocky Neck, there's was some eelgrass right off the site there, you know, signage. You know, a lot of people kind of don't really look at it as much, but maybe, you know, but there could be an opportunity there to alert people to it, make them aware of it. Jamie, I saw you shaking your head too. Did you want yeah, to say? Yeah, I, I wonder if like, um, you know, encouraging NGOs to include eelgrass in their outreach campaigns. So I'm thinking about like the Niantic mm -hmm. River Watershed Committee. We go to Earth Fest. We do talk about eelgrass because we care about it. But, you know, it like providing almost um, like material or, mm -hmm. or information that NGOs could take and put at their tables when they're at events or um, or even potentially small activities that they could do, you know, just educating the people that are out there reaching communities um, at, at that level. So that might be another way to get the general public, you know, in, in, without having to go to the general public directly, but providing a, a package, you know, a media package for eelgrass. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, you know, we had an influx of new people and they were doing some outreach events and such, and they were looking all over for some materials to bring to events with them. So if something's yeah, available, we have it. Grab it. Yeah. I don't know of anything specific for eelgrass. Yeah. You know, the 4-H, the state 4-H program is always looking for activities um, not only for their campers, but they work through public libraries and have activities and kits that they give to the communities. Kids can do those kits and they're at age level too. So that's something to think about in the future as well. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that, like coloring books and videos and just to reach the general public who might not even know what eelgrass is. Another thing I added under kayakers was scuba divers, because there's some good scuba diving groups like Seacon and, and there's, you know, some in the city, some on Long Island. Could those groups help with monitoring? Or yeah, we're actually thinking about recruiting them uh, to help with seed collection, which makes me a little nervous without training. So that gets back to the training 
component, but yeah, there's a lot. So for example, the, um, what's the New York divers out on long Island there, they have a theme coming up next year is diving with a purpose. And so they're going to maybe buoy lobster pots, abandoned lobster pots, so we can come along, clean them up later, or they could help plant eelgrass, or they could help collect eelgrass seed, or to your point, they could be trained by the EPA to do the flowering studies, so we cover more ground. That's a good thought, Tessa. Okay. All right, this is, this is great. Thank you all for bearing with us. Um, any other thoughts before we move on to the next exercise? All right, so we wanna stay on time. So Zach, do you wanna pick this one up? Yeah, sure. So um, our second exercise here is I kind of went and found all the eelgrass outreach I could find from other states programs. And um, we just want you to take a few minutes, maybe we'll do five minutes to look at some of the links I provided there, um, give a, and then we'll have each person give a brief overview of, uh, you know, what they think the goal of that program is in the public engagement process, what they like or don't like about it, and then what tools do these programs have that we might, that we might be able to use in Connecticut. So I can just go through it, but there are parentheses with your name. So Jamie, you're looking at Long Island, uh, Bill, you're going to look at Fisher's Island, Larry, uh, Nova Scotia, and the link's right there, Kelly, Long Island Sound, Eelgrass Story Map, David, the Nature Conservancy Articles and Outreach Video, I'm going to look at Massachusetts, and Tessa, California. These are just ones I found when Googling, so there might be more. Uh, we can talk about that at the end if there's any that are missing here that you think we should discuss. And then at the bottom there, so some people have to repeat, these are stakeholder driven plans. They might not be related to eelgrass directly, but it's just kind of a plan for public participation in a process. So I thought uh, they'd be worth discussing as well. So Jamie, you can look at the Long Island Sound Blue Plan and Tessa, the Shellfish Initiative. So Let's maybe get back at 4.05 and we can go through and discuss these things.
All right, this is a one minute warning to finish up any thoughts and then we're gonna start discussing. Okay, let's get started. Uh, Jamie, do you want to start with talking about the Long Island Eelgrass Outreach efforts? Sure. So this is um, Cornell Cooperative Extensions of Suffolk County's um, website and their workshop program. The, the website has grown over, you know, probably 20 or more years. And so it is very, um, very thorough. There's a lot of information on there. Um, I know that they have a communications person that works on their website. Um, and so it's a pretty good website in terms of being approachable and easy to use and interesting. Um, I think it's a great, uh, great resource, um, a, like a great model for what a Long Island Sound Eelgrass website could look like. Um, and I actually wonder if if maybe there's the potential for getting Cornell Cooperative Extension to make it a Long Island Sound wide eelgrass website versus just a Long Island eelgrass website. Um, they they have worked in Connecticut, so it's not as though they never come over to Connecticut. In fact, they were just here last fall with us, and I think they've worked with Bill. Um, so I think it's a great, great resource. Uh, the Marine Meadows Workshop, this is the program where they have, um, they bring in the community to help weave eelgrass. So this happens on land. Um, participants come and uh, take adult eelgrass plants, weave them into burlap discs, and then um, that's the community, the, the Meadows Workshop part, part of it. Uh, there's some education that happens in that. And um, and this is capitalizing on, you know, engagement with the community to help prep that eelgrass for transplant. And then Cornell's divers go off and, and transplant it, you know, usually the next day. Um, again, great model for getting communities involved in restoration. Um, you typically get 40 or so people attending those, you know, 10, 10, to, 10 to 40 people attending those workshops. And it's uh, an outreach experience. It's not just come and do work. There's also some education that goes on, usually some takeaways, you know, stickers or bags or things that you get at those events. Um, again, a great model for, for engaging community members in restoration while also getting that help. I think Save the Sound has done this with, with the gluing seeds onto clams as well. I think you may have gotten some community members involved. So, um, I think that that they are an excellent template for how to engage with the community. And I think that they have thought a lot about how to engage with the community. So they're a good resource to kind of build out programs in the future. Great. Um, Bill, do you want to talk about the Fishers Island website? Yeah, um, <clears throat> it looks really good very readable um it it's it's not too technical so it's a it's a nice um cartoon sort of a lot of nice really round graphics and great photographs very attractive to just somebody who may not be familiar with eelgrass it's a great intro it has a nice little history section about the wasting disease um and then bringing it up it's got a great picture of jamie actually on one of her webinars so it has like it's got you know current events what are we doing it's got their plans and it's not really a restoration website. Um, so I was really pleased and I hadn't seen this before. They they are noting the fact that around Fishers Island is sort of the stronghold of eelgrass and Long Island Sound. And so if we're going to get seeds for restoration, um, they specifically mentioned that. Um, so their, their role as almost a sanctuary to 
grow out from with some of these techniques we've been talking about on this task force. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, the, the last thing I'll say is that they did a really nice job, and this is something that's very hard to do, is to connect your actions on land, like fertilizing your lawn. They've got beautiful pictures of lawns and how that um, impacts the marine environment as that's fertilizer and things wash downstream. And that's always a really hard connection for people who aren't right on the shoreline is what am I doing in my backyard to do any, how does it affect Long Island Sound? So yeah, very impressive website. Great. Uh, all right, Larry, Nova Scotia. Uh, <laughs> well, not an impressive website. I mean, I mean, it was pretty, but uh, it, it's a new program. It, they've really done very a small amount of restoration. They've come to the conclusion that manual planting isn't a really good approach. And G will look at something later. The one thing I thought was interesting was they had a whole section on what they called their blue carbon program, which to me was a catchy a catchy phrase that I hadn't heard before. And um, I, you know, I I do think that's something that can that we can relate to because most people understand that in terms of the overall climate it may be something we ought to put a little bit more emphasis on so they had some some good thoughts uh and some action plans no no results but action plans on how to address that and i thought the packaging of that part of it was pretty good okay great yeah i mean i just wanted to put everything out there. I'm not saying any of this is good or bad. I just wanted to have stuff out there for discussion. So that's good. All right, uh, Kelly, do you want to talk about the Long Island Sound study eelgrass story map? So I like this story map. It's nice. It starts with a video, like you're swimming over the eelgrass meadow. It's, it's nice. And, um, it, you know, so it gets you in engaged and then it goes through like the background and impacts climate change um, information on the Long Island Sound Study ecosystem targets monitoring restoration has a lot of nice pictures and graphics there's tools to compare you know climate change you're in a warmer temperature you know how the temperature is going to what's it going to become um, you know the, the widget you can slide back and forth um, it does that with uh, some of the mapping as well you know, it's, it's really nice providing a lot of this upfront information about uh, the Long Island Sound Studies ecosystem targets, effort like monitoring groups and efforts for restoration. Um, oh, it, it gets a little um, deeper that you can click on PDFs if you really wanted to get details. Like when they talk about blue carbon, you can get into that plan. Um, there's a couple other links if you really want it to get into more information. Um, and then there's also like three focus areas, which was nice. So by the map and, and the focus areas are lined up on the sidebar and you can click on that and you can go in and then learn more about those focus areas. Um, so I like it, it leaves off with what you can do, but that part is not quite as well developed as far as making the connections between the, you know, just between like your, the, the you know, the resident, the everyday person in the watershed how their activities um, impact uh, the eelgrass survival and then you know what you can do so that that could use a little more work but i like it and it's lying on sound <laughs> it's relevant to what we're doing all right thank you um all right david do you want to talk about the nature conservancy articles um, but i will um so you should all, everyone should read it on. I'm a little biased um, and not objective, but again, um, when a nonprofit, you know, met, it talks about nitrogen, but then alludes to, you know, warming waters impacting eelgrass, I find that to be very misleading. Um, Long Island has had a historical um, nitrogen problem that they haven't addressed from failing septic systems, thousands of them. And it's the same situation Connecticut has in East Lyme and Old Saybrook, where at one point we had court orders. Now we've declined those. Um, just last year, East Lyme voted not to sewer three densely packed communities on the shoreline that 
um, impact the water there. Um, Old Saybrook is spending huge amounts of money evaluating every property. What people don't understand is, is those improvements to those properties are, the, in most cases, the minimum that can be done and nowhere near the standard that's required. So after you do the extensive study, you still end up with cumulatively poor water quality. So, so it does bother me when we get away from the fact that, you know, nitrogen is the problem. In, you know, in Connecticut, I said it before on these calls, in Stonington and Groton, we had very little eel grass back in the, you know, 2000 in that time frame. DEP in those towns have upgraded those sewage treatment plants. In Stonington, it's three plants. Um, and that has, it has had a huge positive impact on the eelgrass recovery there in a short amount of time, in addition to the potential of the shellfish commercial population doubling. So those two things have had this huge positive um, impact. And, and I find it very difficult to believe that water temperatures are so significantly different in Long Island and in, in Groton and Stonington that we, you know, that our water temperatures aren't harming the eelgrass recovery there, yet they are in Long Island Sound. I, I don't believe that. It's still nitrogen. It's always been nitrogen. Um, so then you get down to Virginia, and I, I apologize. They've done a lot of um, seed gathering and seed planting. I didn't see where, um, maybe at the end, but I, I missed where there was a measurement of the success of all that, but they have a huge initiative, that, which is what we're working towards. But the question is, is, is it a positive initiative or not? I, I don't know. And I think it takes more than a five-year period to make that assessment, too. So you ought to read them. There are, again, some beautiful pictures. All right, thanks. Um, I'm going to uh, summarize the Massachusetts outreach that I could find. Uh, the first link is a story map that they're calling a eelgrass or seagrass restoration uh, story map. And it seems like the goal was really to highlight all the areas in Massachusetts that there are restoration efforts of eelgrass and other seagrasses. So I think that goal is good and it does a good job with that, but it's very targeted to people that are doing this kind of work. And um, it's not the most user-friendly and there's not a lot of information on how to or find out more information about each of these efforts. So that could be improved. What I do like is they have kind of a cartoon descriptions of a few different types of uh, methods for how to restore eelgrass. And those are really good. But again, it kind of seems like disjointed with the goal of uh, what this website is. So, um, and then it's unclear how often this is updated, but it's, it's, useful in that it shows where restoration is happening in uh, Massachusetts. And the other one I could find is a Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group website on the eelgrass uh, restoration efforts they've been doing. And that does a, has really good pictures, does a good job of showing, you know, what they've done, the lessons they've learned, and how they're trying to improve. And it has links to more information and clear uh, description of how to contact them if you want to find out more, get information, or get involved. So I think that's really good for the local community there. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So Tessa, do you want to take the next one? Sure. So I actually loved this website. This is a small project in Newport Bay in California, and it's run by a county baykeeper. Their website begins with a statement without strong support, uh, public support, blah, 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 that, you know, any efforts will lag behind those of other coastal ecosystems and they're, you know, right away have a get involved link. Um, so they first got funding to do restoration and quickly um, sort of switch gears and wrote grants for public education and research. And that really shifted their work so that their partners were doing more of the restoration and they were working with community groups. So they had over 3,000 community members in the small geographic area and students involved, they kind of boasted that they planted a third of an acre and they got a whole acre um, via Mother Nature um, over a short period of time, which is not a lot, but they were, again, focused on 
public outreach and engagement on the importance of eelgrass and used it as a means to engage other people about um, important environmental issues in the Bay because there's very poor water quality there. Um, and with the research funding, they were testing three restoration methods, bundling, transplanting eelgrass remotely with frames, and then buoy deployed seeding. So um, they worked with these communities to test these methods. And then the partners basically implemented the, the ones that worked the best. And they had hands-on activities at a nature center. Um, you know, again, community volunteers that were working out in the field and they created um, a few outreach videos and some key messages that they have on their website and that have used in different um, events. So nice small effort. Okay, just to, to stay on time, I mean, we're going to switch a little gears here, but we can just briefly, I know these last two were pretty long documents, so I expect you to give us a ton, but just quickly, what, uh, just a description of what these were and, and how they did a good job or not good job uh, engaging the public. So Jamie, you want to talk about the blue plan? Yeah, I feel like I'm cheating a little because I use the blue plan viewer and the blue plan all the time. Um, so I think going back to when the blue plan was released, um, the public meetings were really well attended. I, I think that they got a lot of stakeholder engagement because this was marine spatial planning and, and people wanted to make sure that their priorities were included in that plan. Um, following up, I'm not aware of a huge, I know that there have been follow-up meetings to the blue plan but I don't know how well attended they have been by that kind of general public stakeholder community. Um, they do have a map viewer. That's what I use often. Um, my impression is that probably a casual user just scrolling around the web is not going to get into that too deeply. Um, so I don't think it's just for, you know, your, your, social media streams, for example. But um, but I, I think it's a great resource for school students looking for more information, for interested community members who are looking for more concrete information. I feel like it's relatively easy to use. I feel like I'm a little biased again because I do use it often. Um, and, and so it probably is harder than I think it is. Uh, but it's a great resource. Um, and I think, uh, I don't know if I put this in here, but but perhaps uh, my suggestion was that perhaps outreach efforts related to seagrass could highlight how that map viewer could be used as a resource, um, you know, both for looking at the location of, of beds and, and how it interacts with their interests, whether that's scuba diving or, or boating or fishing or whatever. Um, the last thing I will just say briefly is I'm not sure how often those layers are updated. Uh, and I just added a comment about that um, in there. There, the essence of time, I'll pass it off to Tess. <laughs> just really quick on that. They're, they're supposed to be updated on the go. So I'm on a steering committee. So we meet like once a quarter with Deep. And you are absolutely right. There's not a lot without the uh, steering of the Nature Conservancy that was really good at bringing stakeholders in. Um, and uh, the NOAA person, it's, it's out there, but not updated as frequently as it should be. All right, go ahead, Tessa. Okay, well, I'm extremely biased on this one, uh, but I'll just say, um, because I was involved in facilitating it, I think that right off the bat, I can say that those of us who facilitated this could have written the plan um, without meeting with anyone, but we would have had limited buy-in, maybe no buy-in and no implementation. And that's really um, where we found the sweet spot to be was having public meetings and workshops. And at every one, we had sort of a, a different type or different way of engaging people. So it was, you know, you come to the table and list all your complaints or opportunities. And then we broke it down into sectors. You know, what's your interest area as a commercial or recreational shell fishing or reef building or whatever it may be. And so over a, you know, a couple of years, we met time and time again. We did polling with um, computer uh, remotes and, you know, sticky notes, just any way we could to, again, engage the audiences. 
And I would say that one of the great outcomes of this initiative is that people were working together on common issues towards the end. So there were a lot of um, strained relationships when we started um, and uh, maybe some groups that we didn't see as maybe having as great a stake in these topics of recreational and commercial shell fishing and, and natural resource, natural shellfish resources. But um, through this process, we were really in, able to engage everyone and involve them in de the decision-making process and then implement the actions um, pretty quickly. So, you know, now we're at a point where we're about um, eight years out and um, updating that plan and reflecting back on all the good work that's been done and the things that are still outliers. All right, so we don't have a ton of time left. I don't know if Jamie, you wanna take it back or Tessa, you wanna to try to fit in the last little question we had here. I say let's try to fit it in. And okay. um, you know, our next meeting, we can, we can discuss kind of overviews of all of this stuff, but let's try, let's try and squeeze it in in our last five minutes. Kelly, uh, do you want to yeah, yeah. comment? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hold the meeting up, but just before we move on. So something that I was thinking about, especially in the story map that I looked at that would give it more, um, I would reorganize it a little bit, but um, adding like the success stories that, you know, why we say you can do these things because there have been successes, right? I, like Dave pointed out as well. Um, I would just mention that. And, I, and I, then I also think, too, you know, there's areas that we are working on getting them sewered, but there's areas that are not and like they seem to not have any options. So those are places that are still hanging out there, you know, with the nutrient um, loading contribution. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so the last kind of question that Tessa and I wanted to ask you all to think about is a time that you might have been involved in a major state or regional initiative in which public engagement efforts went wrong or were non-existent. Um, and do you want to share that and how we might be able to avoid those pitfalls in this effort? Well, I got one. <laughs> I, you, you may have heard about the data center project in Groton. Uh, I was a neutral moderator, I guess, on it and watching the developer make a number of mistakes. So he went after the, what I would call the business stakeholders in the community, trade, the unions, the tradesmen, et cetera, et cetera, totally ignored the conservation community who then wiped them out. So I guess the, the lesson learned is, you know, you gotta be real careful. Sometimes what, what you don't see as the as as a stakeholder happens to be the overriding stakeholder that drives the issue. So that that would be the the one that, the, the one lesson I learned from uh, from watching that little debacle. Um, I have an example, and I I actually wish I could remember the event, um, but. Uh, I can't, which which says something about the the failure of that event. Um, it was supposed to bring together stakeholders from southeastern Connecticut. I think there were like six people in the room, um, and and it came down to not enough advertising and not enough lead time. Um, I I think it was thrown together at kind of the last minute. I felt like I only had maybe two or three weeks notice, so. Yes, we need to get these things done because, you know, there are expectations from funders or people who need reports, but that that lead time and getting it on people's schedule and getting it the news out there are all important pieces. I participated in one on the Tongas, it was called the Tongas Futures Roundtable. And it brought in an incredible amount of stakeholders over uh, how the logging was going to occur. It was funded by the uh, Betty Moore Foundation. 
<clears throat> and it went on for a long time and there was many screaming matches there was different tribal interests there was commercial fishing recreational interests state interests um so there was just so many stakeholders um but i will say in the end i don't think it really ended up with a solution but as it went away other initiatives kind of broke off pieces of it and and took it up and so then there became second growth harvest initiatives and the big sea alaska corporation went for a giant carbon credit so i don't know if that would be really relevant to this stakeholder group but maybe there's a lot of different stakeholders that we just covered today and you know maybe best to bring them all together and then crack them back apart now the lesson from that one to solve each piece within their own interest area. Yeah, along those same lines, um, something we did with the reserve meetings and, and that we picked up from like uh, town meetings in, in Ledger is putting a time limit on people's ability to talk. Um, I've been to some stakeholder meetings where someone gets the floor and it's like a congressional filibuster or whatever they call it where they just talk and talk and talk and you can't stop them. So um, I think setting that time limit has in, been very effective to allow multiple stakeholders to say something. Yeah. And Jamie, I'll just add um, something that's the opposite of that is allowing space for silence for people to think. And one of the biggest mistakes I ever did is I introduced an open-ended question and a farmer said, well, this is an awkward silence. Can we move on? And I was like, oh, okay. And really no one said anything. And I didn't wait long enough. And someone came and pulled me aside afterward and said, I wish you would have waited because I wanted to say something. And, you know, we kind of lost the audience where that person could have said something and someone else could have said, oh, me too. Right. So that awkward silence can be really important. Yeah, and I think there's that balance between, you know, allowing the space for silence, limiting people's information, but I think it gets back it gets back to Bill's suggestion of bringing people together and then breaking them apart. So providing those follow-up opportunities to have longer conversations is also important. You know, you you can't always say what you need to say in 3 minutes. Um and so being open to following up with people is also uh, uh, important. I'll just share a quick parable on that time limit thing. At the Alaska Board of Fish, they have lights, green, yellow at the one minute, red, and your mic gets cut. So I don't know if anyone else has been at those type of air, those type of testimonies, but um, it definitely doesn't allow for those longer discussions and some cultures are oral traditions and they're used to going getting to their point in a roundabout way um so yeah creating some kind of space like uh like an offshoot for those deeper conversations is really i think really important to getting at the getting at the point well that's all we had for you and we're at time so thanks for doing such a great job <laughs> And thank you guys for facilitating. I thought yeah. that was very effective. It was uh, in interesting thoughts and discussions. All right. So our next meeting is coming up. I've forgotten the date already, but I think it's on our calendars, hopefully. Um, and uh, I will be sending out uh, some notice when the, our draft is more fully fleshed out uh, for the recommendations. All right, guys. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Tetra and Zach. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great weekend.